One of my favorite memories is when I was a child, we would go to grandma's house and she would open a jar of her canned meat. Sometimes it was canned pork, sometimes it was um, beef roast, but I can't even explain to you how delicious it was. Melt in your mouth perfection, super moist, pre-seasoned and already cooked. So literally you're taking the lid off and you have something to serve your family that's amazing right in the state that it's in. You don't even have to warm it up. Now, I wanna walk you through the simple steps of how to do this for yourself. And you may have been intimidated in the past, but today we're just making it absolutely scrumptious and absolutely simple. Those are my two promises to you today. So, stick around. As long as you have the right elements and ingredients, you are good to go with this. So, I'm just gonna talk you through really quick the elements that you need to make this a success. And of course, the biggest one is kind of an investment and it's this 921, that's the number I've got, All-American Canner. You could do it with any other number <laughs> of canner. This is about the medium size, but they have several even larger than this and one that's smaller. You could also use Presto or some other brand if you have a good uh, pressure canner. Cannot be a steam canner, can't be a water bath canner, and there's no way to make those work for this. So make sure you have a good pressure canner. And of course, I love the All-American because it is proven to be about the safest and about the most reliable canner that has ever been made. Okay, that's probably a no-brainer for you, but I'm just making sure you know then you're going to need canning jars. And I loved these little pink uh, vintage style ball canning jars that I got. These were made in the USA. However, the ball canning lids, I don't believe are made in the USA anymore. However, I do wanna just mention superb canning lids. If you haven't tried them, you're gonna love them. They are made in the USA and this is not sponsored by them, but I love how when I open the, the box, it has a little scripture written right there. That's um, pretty cool. But then you'll notice they have a blue ring that is a wonderful, thicker, better sealing ring, ring than regular ball lids and a very distinct pop that you'll hear when they seal. So there's a lot of reasons I like to use superb canning lids. The, the jars that I'm going to use today though are not the little pint size. We're actually going to use these ball jars that are wide mouth and they're a pint and a half. So you're getting three full cups full of food here to feed your family. And if you have more than two mouths to feed around you, you might be really thankful. This is smaller than a quart and larger than a pint. Obviously it's right in between, but I also love that it has the wide mouth on it. So everything can go in easily and also be brought out very quickly and easily if you're trying to feed a family really fast. Whereas a lot of jars have the little um, shoulder on them, which makes them, I guess it's supposed to make, when you're pouring liquid out of them, it doesn't uh, come out as, it doesn't splash around as much, it's easier to pour. But um, anyway, when you're canning meat, wide mouth is usually going to be your simplest bet. All right, a couple of the other elements, you want a big old bowl because we're gonna put our meat cubes in there. You're going to want one of these handy dandy jar lifters that you've seen me use before on any canning video there's nothing been invented that's better than this for lifting your jars in and out of the hot water. You're going to want one of these funnels that's either wide mouth or small mouth. This is small mouth, but it works just fine for a large mouth, but it goes right on to the, to the top of this so that when I'm putting the meat in here in a minute with the lid off, of course, when I'm putting the meat in, it doesn't get the rim all mucked up and that's a good thing. All right, obviously you want a very good sharp knife. This is one of my favorites and this was a, a very special gift from one of you um, prep stetters. It's by Forge 37 and I'll put the link to them down below. Handmade, beautiful knife, but you just want a big, good, very sharp knife because we're gonna be cutting up a whole bunch of pork loin here in a minute. And then, 
<laughs> you're gonna want to get yourself the right kind of meat this is not seasoned it has been kept cold it's not frozen this is just a half pork loin and so it's over four pounds that we're doing here but you could easily half this recipe and if you had about two two and a half pounds of pork you could use that I'm going to be using this four and a half pounds almost of pork today and it's gonna work perfect for this before you start cutting up your meat you're gonna to want to make sure you have Clorox wiped down everything around you so there's no chance of bacteria being around and of course some people are very opposed to using any kind of wood utensils or wood cutting board but I've wiped this and, and sterilized it as best as I can and I am not scared of it I haven't ever had problems before so good strong very uh, sharp knife and I am literally going to just cut this up into about one to two inch cubes. I don't want them much bigger than that. Um, and I'll, I'll say this, this is pretty lean pork. If I had a lot of uh, fat on it, I would want to take that off. Now, if you turn it over, you think, oh no, there's a whole amount of fat on that. There, but it's very thin, that's a very thin layer. And if I were to cut all of that off, it doesn't make it very good. You, you need a little fat in there for this to be delicious when you open that jar. So don't take every bit of it off or you'll regret it. Now, I've got a nice uh, loin cut here. I'm just gonna cut that into about six more pieces or nine pieces here, just so you can see quickly about how much I cut that up. Yeah, about nine cross section pieces somewhere in that one to two inch range is all you want and you're just going to throw them in a bowl now the secret about this while i'm cutting i'll tell you is that we don't have to season this at all we don't have to add anything to it we don't have to cook it nothing if we just cut it up like i'm doing now and then put it right into the jars we could can it just like that and it would be fantastic even without salt. It doesn't even need salt to preserve it because the um, processing time and the high heat and pressure is going to make it so that it's killed off everything that the salt would if we were using salt. Now, I like it to be extra scrumptious though, so I'm not going to overcomplicate it, but I am gonna add some really delicious uh, spices here to it and we'll toss those in with it so all the pieces are covered in good spices before I throw it in. Interestingly, when you, when you uh, pack pork, you do not add water to it because it's going to have enough of its own juices that fill up the jar. So we're cold pack canning right now. That means we're not even going to, to heat this up or anything. And it's, it's kind of dry pack, so there's no moisture that we're adding to it. Can you believe that? Anyway, that makes this extra simple, and I hope that that gives you hope that I haven't overcomplicated it for you. I'll meet you back here in just a minute, and we'll get it seasoned up with some delicious uh, spices. Now, literally, I've just cut that up. I've washed all the surfaces and knives and my hands again, and you do want to do that in between each each phase of this process but literally right now I could just pack these cubes raw right into this not add anything and and can it and they'd be great but I've got some delicious little additives that I know are okay to add that are gonna make this perfectly seasoned when it comes out let me talk you through a few of them now salt is the first one and this is Himalayan pink salt I'm gonna put uh, four teaspoons of this in now, uh, you could put more or less, and that's okay. Some people put in one teaspoon per jar. Uh, this will probably fill up at least six jars. But for right now, I'm gonna start with four teaspoons, and I'm just gonna sprinkle about half of it over the top of them and stir them up and then add the other half. So here's two kind of rounded-ish teaspoons full of salt that I'm sprinkling all over that. I'm gonna add about half of the other ingredients before I add the other half of that salt, just because I like to stir it about halfway through and get everything as it should be. The next thing I'm going to add, well, there's several different things. 
where shall I start? Let's go with pepper. That's an easy enough one. You can put as much or as little pepper in as you want. And you could use the pre-ground pepper just like that. Or if you want to get fancy, you can get yourself a pepper grinder with red, white, and green, and black uh, peppercorns that are all at different stages of maturity and grind that up fresh and put it in here. I've tried it both ways and I really haven't noticed a difference. So if you want to keep it simple and still be scrumptious, just go with your regular old pre-ground as long as it's fresh and hasn't been sitting around for 20 years. So for this, I'm going to put in one heaping teaspoonful of the ground pepper. It looks like a lot right now, but that's, that's a lot of meat it's going to season, so I'm not concerned about that. The next thing it's going to call for, which really ramps up the flavor, is allspice. And I've got some that's pre-ground here, but I'll tell you what, it's in a pretty can, but this is at least 20 years old, maybe 30 or 40 years old. This came from my grandma's cabinet when she died, and, and I smell of it, and I can tell that it's allspice, but it's not really exciting. So to get that fresh, rich taste. I'm taking whole allspice, which is what I have here in the cabinet. I'm pouring it into my little mortar and pestle, and I'm gonna grind it up and put it in there. I just want you to know, if you've got the pre-ground allspice, it's much simpler. I just happen to not have any on hand, and I've got about a teaspoon worth in there, so I'm gonna dump it all in here, grind it up, and add that to this. All right, got it ground up nice and fine or fine enough. <laughs> Somebody might get a little tiny bit of ground allspice in their bite. But there I'm putting in one teaspoon of that for this whole amount. Right now we've got about half of the, the spices in, so I'm gonna go ahead and give it a good stir. And that just will mix it around and get some of that salt on everything. And the next things we're going to add is the other half of the salt, like I mentioned. And we're gonna add garlic which always is good. You almost can't add too much of that. All right, let's go ahead and add a few more things. I'm gonna add the rest of the salt to start with, which is two more of these rounded teaspoons. The Himalayan salt is a little less salty than some of the other kinds, so, um, it's okay if you go just a little bit generous on that. Then you're going to want to put in onions. Now, let me tell you this. You can put in caramelized onions, which I've done before, and it's scrumptious. If you want to go to the trouble to caramelize those onions in a frying pan, um, I recommend it. It's delicious. You can dollop those in the top of each. But minced onion from the store, cheap minced onion, or I've made my, my own plenty of times in the dehydrator, if you've got some of that, it'll work just fine. I'm just going to use about two tablespoons of this. It doesn't have to be rehydrated. And mixing this in is going to give such an immense boost of flavor all through the pork. Um, you'll be amazed at the difference. If there was one ingredient I would add besides the salt, it would be this minced onion. I'm gonna add two rounded tablespoons of that. And again, I'm doing this for over four pounds of pork. So if you had half of this, you just put in one tablespoon. Or you can do it the fancy way if you want it to be the nice caramelized onions. All right, now let's put in garlic. And again, you could use your own minced garlic right out of the garden. You could do it from the, the store in the already minced for you version, or you could use this dried version. And for today, I haven't tried the dried version before, but I know it's going to be fantastic and it's even a little bit more concentrated flavor. I think I'm going to try that this time just for fun and I'll let you know what I think. But for this, we're going to add in um, the equivalent of two cloves of garlic. Let me just see what that's going to be about one heaping teaspoon is going to be a, a clove of garlic for this. So let's add in two of these. There's one teaspoon, and here's another teaspoon. All right, it's time to stir all this together. 
Now the last ingredient of these yummies that I haven't put in here yet that we put directly into the jar itself is going to be those bay leaves. You're gonna put one bay leaf, one full bay leaf in each jar. And that's easy enough. Uh, I usually put it in the very bottom, but if you like to put it on the side, it kind of looks pretty on the shelf with one bay leaf there smiling at you <laughs> in your jar on the shelf of canned meats. Okay, this is smelling amazing. I don't know if you can tell that my mouth is watering as I'm talking because this smells so delicious with the pepper and the garlic and the salt and all of it. I am loving the smell of that. All right, we've got our ingredients here to put together. One of the nice things about pressure canning is that it is not required that you um, sterilize every single thing fresh right before you put it into the pressure canner because it's going to have so much of that uh, going on already. All right, I'm gonna start by putting one of these into each jar, one nice big bay leaf and that's gonna impart the rest of the wonderful flavor that we want for each of these. And one more. I'm just doing four jars to show you today, but I'll bet that we're gonna have enough meat here to do maybe six jars, and we'll soon find out. All right, so I've got very sterile, clean jars. I've got my lovely funnel that's gonna help me out, and I'm just gonna start packing it full of pork. You want to remember through this process that your attempt is to keep everything clean as you go and you really kind of want to keep the pork uh, cold just it's whoops it's just safer that way if if you keep it cold all the way up until you're ready to use it and then cold as you're doing it so don't forget your project and have to come back an hour or two later while it's sitting on the counter also as we fill these we're going to not push them down real hard. I'm going to get them filled in there nicely, but we always want to leave one inch of space, which should be right to this little collar on the jar. That's the one inch mark, which makes it nice and easy to see. Uh, you don't want any huge air bubbles down in there, but don't push it down so hard that you regret it later. Uh, we really want it to just be kind of modest pack. I'm gonna put this one away over here and I'll wash it and fix it up here in a minute. All right, so there's one jar. Here we go with another. The other neat thing is that the, the jar lids where in the past they were telling us that we had to put those in hot water and get this, get this rim all gummy and they're saying, nope, for, for this type of high heat, high pressure canning, that is not required. It's going to take care of itself. So even though you think this sounds more complicated, it actually has a few elements to it that are relatively easier. And as I'm going, I'm getting excited because I think this is going to fit perfectly in four jars. All right, there's jar number two. I'll move these around so you see it. Um, you can use old lid rings. You see I've got new ones here and I like using new ones on meat like this just because um, I don't want any rust on those rings. That's just a personal preference. I don't think that they're going to fault me if, if you were to consult the USDA on that. And speaking of the USDA, I want to say that um, there are so many elements to canning that I cannot cover here. I am keeping it very simple for us, and there are plenty of, um, I call them canning Nazis. I don't know that that's a good word to use, but um, there are many people out there that have so many rules involved in canning that they make it not fun anymore. And it's wise to listen to them, but then to also learn by doing it yourself. And, and just doing it carefully and prudently. But you should consult professionals to make sure if you have a question about anything that would compromise potentially the seal or the, the, the temperature that you're going to use and making sure that all the potential for botulism or anything like that, if you're concerned of that, even if you're not concerned, I want you to consult the USDA's website or your 
local county extension office, they're going to have canning regulations and rules and guidelines that just really take all of the questions and answer them for you so you're not concerned about, oh no, did I do something wrong? Am I going to poison my family? I've never done it. <laughs> I've never poisoned anybody yet, but I suppose it has probably happened before to somebody. I am excited that this is all fitting, you guys. This is gonna be perfectly four jars of canned pork. All right, I've got them filled up. And what I'm going to do here, I'm just checking visually, and I do see I have an air bubble kind of in the bottom of that. So I'm gonna take something long and clean, and I'm going to just kind of poke it down there to make sure that we don't just have a big old giant air gap that needs addressed later. So visually inspect your jars. Yes, they can have plenty of gaps, but just nothing massive, like the size of a chunk of meat that, that is not there or something. Um, these all look pretty good. I see one gap there. Let me poke some stuff down in there. And um, again, we're not adding water. I know that sounds counterintuitive, but these get really juicy and will make their own juice and you'll, you'll have it completely filled by the time that you're done canning, surprisingly. All right, the next thing I'm going to do is take a paper towel and I've got this saturated with white vinegar and I just wipe the rims really well. This is my last chance to once again confirm that there are no cracks or little um, jiggers on the side. You want it to be perfectly smooth and perfectly clean for the seal to, to work perfectly for you. If you find that you have an old jar that has a little hairline fracture or crack, don't take the chance of using it because those cannot hold up in a pressure canner. These are almost new jars. All right, I've got them all wiped and clean. Now I'm just going to take these clean, new, superb canning lids and put on each one. Make sure it's centered the way it needs to be right over that clean rim. And then finger tight. And when I try to explain that, it's just take three of your fingers, not your whole hand and not real tough. I just want you to take three fingers of your choice and go ahead and uh, roll that down just until it's fully on there, not cranked down super tight, okay? We're gonna do that with all of these. So if I can make sure I have the lid on correct, and then I'm not doing very good at showing you the perfect way, but there's finger tight on that. I am so excited to show you this. There's number three. That one I might have gotten a smidgen tight. All right. Believe me, the process is much more forgiving than you think. So when you're just stressed out on the first try, no. Just trust that there's a little grace that's gonna come into play here that's gonna take care of you on some of this. All right, I've got four jars ready to go in the pressure canner. And I'm actually going to can four jars of ground beef right alongside these because the pressure canning uh, instructions are identical for both of these once we get them in there. So it holds eight jars and I'm going to fill four more up with beef and I'll show you that in a different episode. But these are ready to go. If you haven't seen a pressure canner before, I want to just at least introduce you to it so you're familiar with it. It's going to come with all these stickers that they do want you to keep on it that have all kinds of warnings of heat and pressure and don't leave it unattended and all of that. Some people like to take those off and I probably will someday. <laughs> but it's gonna have a gauge here that's really important. It's a geared gauge and you need to make sure that it's in good working order. If there's any doubt that it might not be working, definitely go and have it checked or, or call the manufacturer and see what they can help you with getting you a new gauge. And then over here on the side, you're going to see the steam vent. This, you're going to have a weight that sits on top of if you look closely, you're gonna see that it is listed with a five, 10, and 15 pounds that that is representative of. So the five is directly across from this little spot. Um, you want the five down and out of this hole is kind of where that five pounds of pressure is regulated. Or if I wanted to have 10 pounds of pressure, I put the 10 right there over top of it and this is regulating that or 15 pounds. 
if you're you're going to need to look up exactly where you live you can even google what is my elevation because that makes a huge difference in which one of these numbers you're going to use and what you're going to be looking for on this gauge the usda website or your county extension office can tell you now incidentally here where i am standing in this exact spot it's 907 feet elevation above sea level so because of that i fall under the thousand foot mark which means that for this meat i am supposed to process it with 10 pounds of pressure so i'll be doing that here in just a few mo minutes now interestingly though you don't put this on at first you have to wait till it's uh, wait till a certain thing happens here before you know it's time to put that uh, little weight on and then i just want to bring you uh, attention to this one little nubbin back here that's kind of hard to see let me see if I can turn this around this is just a safety measure that is built into these so that uh, it's a rubber stopper of sorts but before this whole thing explodes which is what everyone just dreads and thinks oh no that could happen to me imagine if it all exploded they've built this rubber stopper in so that that would blow out first and be able to depressurize this before you have like this whole thing become something that it shouldn't be, <laughs> you understand. So be thankful that that little nubbin is there and that's what's gonna save anything like the rest of this exploding in the event that somehow you weren't attending it as you should. Okay, also you're gonna see something interesting about this steam canner in particular, uh, the All-American, is that it has no rubber ring where if you were to use a Presto or some of the other kinds of, of pressure canners, they have a, a rubber gasket around here. Well, this is stainless steel or uh, aluminum, very, very thick aluminum, and it doesn't use any kind of a gasket. You just have to fit it down perfectly with a little uh, arrow here lined up with this special little uh, indention here on, down below it and then you'll see how these carefully are able to slide underneath and grip a hold of that as it should so that you're ready to to tighten it down there's a little bit more to it than that and you'll see here in just a minute because you want to make sure the the lid is perfectly level as well and we'll do that here in just a minute but to start what we need to do is you start with it just right at, at cold temperature. I mean, it's at room temperature right now. And in the bottom, it has this um, little elevator that elevates all of the jars just half an inch or three quarters of an inch above the bottom of it. If you don't have this, you have complete disaster. So remember to make sure you check that you have your little um, bottom in it as it should be. If you don't have one, you can use just rings, uh, jar rings. If uh, I could just put five of those around in the bottom and they would elevate the jars just fine. Keep in mind, you can, you can get by with that just fine, but this is going to keep them from touching the bottom. And once I put that in the bottom, I'm going to put the jars right in here. Now today I am doing, as you have seen probably, I'm doing three quart and a halfs of uh, I'm sorry, pint and a half of hamburger that is seasoned. And I'm doing four of the um, seasoned pork loin, which is gonna be fantastic. It's not cooked. The hamburger uh, or ground beef is cooked, but we're putting them all in here because thankfully they all use the same exact time and pressure for their processing. This will hold eight of these wide mouth jars Incidentally, I only have seven here. That was the amount of meat that I have, so it's perfect. I've got all of them fit in there nicely. Now I'm going to fill it up so that there is three inches worth of water in there. And you just want regular room temperature water. It's not like a water bath canner where you're filling it so that there's water an inch above the top of the lids. In this situation, we just are putting in three inches worth of water there in the bottom which will come up about halfway on the sides of these jars. All right, we've got the jars in here. We've got about three and a half inches worth of water. We have the little elevator to keep them off the floor, and that's, of course, very important. And they're not touching each other right now or the sides. 
They may adjust a little bit as they go, but they're going to be just fine. I have the burner already set just now to high, even though I started with room temperature water here in the bottom. And now it's time to put on the lid. For some folks, this can be a huge ordeal. This is the most complicated part. I'm hoping it makes it simple for us today. But I'm just lining the, the pointer that you saw up with the little indention on the side of my canner. See if it seats down in there nicely. And then, and then uh, all of these should come underneath as they should, kind of the little. Now I'm gonna visually inspect it and make sure that it's equally the same on each side. See how it kind of has play in it? And we don't want one side to be higher than the other. So give me just a minute and I'm gonna make sure. This is a pro canner tip that you may or may not be interested in knowing, but it might save you some angst if you're, if you're a newbie. And that is something that some people do. Let me grab these. So they call it, you need three lids that match. Here I've got three lids. Uh, they call it the three lid method and what you can do is so I have the lid on right now But I've got three canning lids that are smashed together just like that And I'm going to set them in here and see how that kind of is right there If I can make sure that this lid on this side Exactly has that three lid gap and then I come to the opposite side and nope They don't fit in quite as well, but if I can adjust it so that they do and kind of bring it around the whole thing. It's, it's almost like a little measure that helps you say, oh, okay, in the back it's too tight, or in the front it's too tight. I think we've got it, I really do. I think we've got it as perfect as it's going to be. Once you've got it there, thank, thankfully, you're gonna take opposing sides. So it could, it'll be these two first, or these two first. There's actually six of them all together, and once we've got it on, we just want to take the two that are opposite each other, it doesn't matter which two, and we want to crank them down just about three turns until they're just, just barely finger tight. Then we take the opposite ones over here, and we'll do the same with them, barely finger tight, and then the opposites, and again, about three turns makes them about perfectly finger tight if I have done it right. Okay, and now I'm going to go ahead back to those two originals and make it uh, fully tight. So there's another half turn, another half turn, and another half turn. And that just go all the way around until you've got all of it fully tight. Remember, I've got the heat on high now. Good, looks like it's good to go. But I, I just want to make sure you're aware. Let me turn it toward you carefully. It's a heavy booger. I want to make sure that you recognize this is completely by itself with no weight on it. You do not put the weight on until this starts spewing st steam in a perfect constant stream, okay? Once it starts spewing steam in a perfect constant stream, and you just need to stay around and eyeball it until it does, but when, once that happens, we're gonna set the timer for 10 minutes. I will tell you this. I have read some people do it just for one minute. Some people do it just for four minutes. And others insist that 10 minutes is the only number that you should use before you put the weight on. So just to be safe and to accommodate those very specific guidelines, we're going to wait 10 minutes once this starts spewing steam um, and so I'll set a timer and we'll know it's time for us to put on the weight for our elevation. For our elevation, while we're, we're waiting for this, I'll tell you, we're just below that 1,000 foot uh, above sea level. So because of that, and, and for the size of the jars that I have going in here, the directions for a pint-sized jar of meat in this for my elevation would be to process it for 75 minutes with 10 pounds of pressure, okay? If it was a quart jar, we're supposed to put it up to 90 minutes at 10 pounds of pressure for this elevation. Now, these are exactly halfway in between, and so I'm going to split the difference and do it for 
82 and a half minutes. <laughs> That's what our timer will say at 10 pounds of pressure for that time. Now, also keep in mind, if you're right on the edge, like I said, I'm at 907. That's the 907 feet above sea level. Because of that, I could just recognize that right there at the 1000 sea level, above sea level mark, I need to go to the higher number. So you're gonna, I'm gonna show you once we get this up to the the temperature that it's supposed to be and the and the pounds of pressure you're going to notice that we may just go a smidgen over that because we're right at that mark you see if you're below a thousand feet sea level it's one direction and if you're above a thousand feet sea level it's another um, amount of of heat and pressure that you want so you kind of split the difference if you're right there on the mark if you know what i mean and i'll show you that once we get there okay Let's give this a little bit of time. It's gonna get up to steam here in just a few minutes and then we'll start the timer. All right, here in just a minute, the timer is gonna go off because this has been going for about 10 minutes. But do you see that good, strong, steady stream of steam coming up? That's exactly what we want to see. So we've let this go for about 10 minutes where it's just this straight steam stream coming up with no breaks in it. It doesn't just go and then stop, go and stop. What it's doing is it's getting all of the uh, oxygen and such out of the inside of this. Uh, and, and even right here, the gauge is starting to build. It won't build a whole lot. And there's the timer. It won't build a whole lot until I put this on. But now that we know that this is ready, it's ready for me to go ahead and put this on. And we know it needs to be at 10 pounds of pressure. So I've got that ready and I'm going to just set it on and it's going to start building its, its pressure even more. All right, Whew. much quieter. Now what's happening next though is that it's building the pressure and you're going to see this gauge start moving up until it gets all the way to where it needs to be. Um, for our elevation again we're wanting the 10 pounds which is right there on this gauge but since we're right on the cusp we're gonna go just a little bit over that and I'll be just fine with that. The reason we'll know we're at the right place is this will start having a certain kind of almost rhythm to it. It's gonna make more noise, but as the pressure builds up to where it needs to be, this is going to start, oh, they call it bouncing, but what you'll hear is it'll rattle and then it'll stop, rattle, stop, and we'll know that we've reached the right pressure for our elevation. And as we confirm it with the gauge, between the gauge and the sound and the rhythm it's got going, we'll know it's time to start the clock for that 75 to, for us, it's 82 and a half minutes because of the size of our jars. <laughs> All right, I'll show you that, what that looks like here as we get closer. All right, you're gonna notice it's a lot louder now. It's reached the temperature that we need. It's over 10 pounds, but it's under the 15. It's right at about 12 pounds of pressure. Uh, and, and we're gonna leave it there, but I'm going to turn the heat down. It was on high, and now it's time to turn it down to just about a medium high so that it doesn't get cooler, but doesn't get too much hotter either. And you'll notice that there's quite a rhythm going on over here with this. You'll hear it as it jigs like this and then it'll pause and just kind of hold itself for a second and then it'll start jigging some more and you'll know you've got the right amount of pressure and heat going on and that's when we start the timer. All right, I'm not going to talk to you for 82 and a half minutes, but you can see I've got it going behind me. We've got the timer set and we're waiting. And so I just wanted to share a couple of little tips with you, although you do want to check with the officials the either get yourself in a Facebook group where they're all into canning and you can ask any question under the sun and they won't make fun of you, but they'll tell you the right procedure for, for whatever it is you're wanting to know about. Um, they also know where to get good lids or good canning jars when the supply chain is broken and everybody's looking for jars at the same time. But I did think, I, I just wanted to at least share a couple of things. So I get my jars a lot of times through tractor supply, believe it or not. These pink jars are supposed to be vintage. This is actually canned pork I'm holding here. And these pink jars are fantastic for um, 
anything that I'm doing that's extra special that might be a gift or something like that. Or if it's going to be shown, uh, I just want it beautiful on my shelf and I don't think there's anything wrong with having it be beautiful. So Tractor Supply is a great place to find hard to find jars sometimes. Now, I will say though, the jars I'm using today, anytime I use these, I have lots of people say, where did you get those? Those are so cool. And I have to just admit to you, it is kind of hard to find these. They're rarely available, but I wanted to lift up the box and let you see this. These are ball mason jars. These are nine pint and a half, 24 ounce jars. That's just unusual. Usually you get them in a dozen pack or something like that. These are nine uh, jars that you'll get in this and they're taller than, than the others, but they're fantastic for stuff like tall vegetables, asparagus, if you're counting asparagus, these are perfect for that kind of thing. And any ball jars that you buy, always save the, the box because they're perfect for storing right back in the box on your canning shelf. And also, thankfully, the boxes often have good instructions and sometimes a really nice recipe right on them. This is for lemon pickled asparagus it has on here with the instructions of how to can it correctly. So I just wanted to give you that pro tip of in case you are wanting this exact kind of jars. These are hard to find and when I looked online today just so I could be updated with the information, you might find them a couple of different places. I know Berlin Packaging at this moment has them available. Tractor Supply, sometimes Lehman's Hardware Store up in, there in Ohio has them. Um, every now and again, you'll find them at Ace Hardware or on Amazon. Just look around at the, at the typical places, do a Google search and you'll be able to get the kind of jars you're looking for. And there are many other different suppliers out there. The other thing I wanted to just quickly mention though is you noticed that the, the recipe that I did today, I put some little additives in and you want to be very careful about that. You saw me add garlic and pepper and salt and some onion and things like that. But the reality is, is if you are going to experiment, you need to go ahead and ask a few questions either to your county extension office or to somebody who really knows canning well. Let me give you a couple of examples. If you were to add um, sage or thyme right now to some of your canning that you're doing in a pressure canner, interestingly, those get bitter over time and can taint the whole taste. So even if the recipe called for that, don't put sage or thyme. At least that's, not, that's my recommendation is that you leave those out and add them later. Um, other things like cumin get stronger over time. So if you were to add it to be just the right flavor now, you'd notice if you took that canning uh, jar of whatever you put cumin in three years from now off the shelf and, and opened it, you might have a very strong taste to it that you didn't plan on. So that's why it's important to talk to somebody who knows canning if you're ever in doubt or you want to start experimenting with what you're going to add or delete from a recipe. There's a real reason that they get it down to kind of a fine science on some of their recipes for canning. We're going to wait for this to finish and I'm going to show you back as we get closer to the end. I wanted to talk over top of it just so you could kind of hear the rhythm and sound of it in the background. It is a little bit loud and it does get hot if you're in the middle of summer. So you might find yourself finding it more convenient to can outside on like a, a propane grill or something like that. Many people choose to can that way or to even have a little summer kitchen out there if you can afford it where you can keep the heat out of the house for the summer. But do what works for you. I don't have a summer kitchen and this is just fine in my little munchkin sized kitchen. I don't mind the noise for 75 or 82 and a half minutes today before we have a delicious preserved meat for several years to come. I'll meet you back here closer to the finish line. So our timer went off telling us that the time is up and that's good news. So what you do at the end of that time is just come over and turn the heat off. That's all you have to do, nothing more. Now, if you are hefty and you want to move it off the heat, I know some directions say move the canner off the heat, but if you knew how heavy this is by itself and then loaded with all those jars and that water, it's too big for me to be moving right now. So w without a catastrophe and it's exceptionally hot. Okay, no more steam and the pressure has 
gone all the way down to zero, it's still very, very hot. So I'm going to, just like when I put the lid on, I'm going to go opposites on these and take two of them, about three, actually, let's see, four, there, that, that lets them down. And now I'm going to take two more opposite. Whoop, sorry, I don't want to burn myself and I'm being a little skittish here. All right, we'll take this off. Hold on. A little farther. Okay, here we go. I'm going to put the lid away from me when I lift it off. And let's see if we did it right. Ooh. They're still so super hot. I'm hearing just a little bit of probably some siphoning, which is not really what you want. <laughs> but let's see if they turned out here. They were well over boiling temperature all of this time, so you can imagine how much heat and pressure they're under still even. The water in there does look clear, so I'm not seeing any evidence of siphoning out here, but there is one of them that doesn't look like it has a whole lot of juice in it, and that may be just the way it is. All right, I'll just take one jar out at a time, and gently, this is the one that had the least amount of juices, and that's the pork loin. Ooh. There's a hamburger. I'm calling it hamburger, but that's what I grew up calling it. It's actually ground beef and bison, half and half. I did these together because I had the right amount for filling it as long as I had both at the same time. So we've got two different episodes of Prep Stetters. One is on how to can pork loin and one is on how to can ground beef or bison or venison or what, any of those. I've put them on a, a towel now to rest for the evening. I give them about an inch space apart between each jar and just let them rest. Don't, don't twist the lids tighter that are very loose now. Don't try and poke on the tops or anything like that. Right now I think all of them except for two have already sucked in their top. Very loud, nice um, click sound and assurance that those are sealed correctly and I'm sure these two will take their time and, and hopefully click in the next few moments. But what I want you to know is it's not that hard. By tomorrow morning I'll come out here. These will all be back to room temperature. I will trust that all the lids will be nicely inverted and I'll know that they've all sealed well. To test that, you just take the ring off and, and lift it by the lid and it should lift up and hold all of its weight easily without coming unsealed or anything like that. Um, and those will be ready to store away in a pantry for a good long while. Now, if you have not considered learning how to can meat, this is the day to do it. This is the time. There is not a time to wait for later to come when it's going to be better for you. You're the youngest you will ever be right now. Time is not in the middle of a crisis as much as it may be later. And you will be so thankful for right now when you took the time to learn how to can meat and invest in the right canner that's going to work for you and your family. So it wasn't that difficult. It was, going, it was very simple and it is going to be very scrumptious. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us this week. I hope you take the time to share this with someone that you love. Join us back here again next time when we explore more options of, of how to either survive through homemaking skills or out in the wild. We have so much of that coming up this, this uh, season where it's just perfect to get out in the fall weather and do some things outside. So we've got lots of good stuff coming. Anyway, we'll see you next time. And until I see you again, go out and find someone to be a blessing to today. Thank you and God bless you. Bye-bye. <laughs>Hey there, before you go, I would love to share just a word of scripture with you. This is out of the old King James Version of the Bible, right there in the middle in the book of Isaiah, 
chapter 26, verse 3. It says this, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. Now go spread the word.